On this episode of What the Ship, U.S. warships struggle to stay at sea as China's fleet grows. Price cap on Russian refined fuels set to disrupt the trade. There's a shortage of offshore ships. According to the Hop Hog Lloyd CEO, the party is over for container shipping. And you've heard of cocaine bear, but what about cocaine cow? All that on today's episode. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Holy crud, that's a lot of news to go over right there. Cocaine cow? Seriously, Sal? Wait till it, it's the end story. You'll love this story. All right, we got a lot to cover. We're going to cover it all here on our weekly What the Ship. Uh, lots of news. We're going to start off with something a little bit unusual. We're going to go with the U.S. Navy story. Usually we don't do that. We usually cover the commercial side, but I think this has a lot of implications. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a second, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and dive into story number one. All right, story number one is actually two stories that came out on G-Captain regarding the U.S. Navy. And again, we usually don't cover the U.S. Navy in a lot of detail, but I think this topic is paramount for understanding what's happening with commercial shipping, not just internationally, but in the United States. So, Bloomberg story, U.S. warships struggle to stay at sea as China's fleet grows. This is a GAO report, a government accounting office report that came out that is really critical of the U.S. Navy and its ability to keep its vessels at sea. Right now, the U.S. Navy has a mandate to operate 355 ships. It's nowhere near that. It's about 300 ships. I've been working on a video on U.S. Navy shipbuilding, and I gotta tell you, it is the most frustrating video I've been doing because every time I do it, I just get frustrated with it because, number one, the Navy's numbers don't match up. They just don't work. Uh, I don't know where they get their numbers, who's doing their math, but their math doesn't work up with the number of ships they're commissioning, the number of ships they're decommissioning, and they're never going to get the 355. They're bouncing right around 300 ships right now. And so this GAO report looks at the maintenance issue they're plaguing it. Basically, the U.S. Navy is shrinking, getting older, and it is in poor material shape. And I argue this has everything to do with the disillusionment, the disintegration of the U.S. commercial industrial base, particularly the maritime base. If you're not building merchant ships, if you're not maintaining merchant ships, if you're not maintaining shipyards to build commercial ships in, you cannot build warships. We don't have Navy shipyards building Navy ships. They're in commercial shipyards. And when the only customer at these shipyards is the U.S. Navy, that's a problem. There's a second story here, too, that really deals with this issue even more, and that is this one. Uh, this is a story that came from SIMSEC, the Center for International Maritime Security. U.S. Navy needs tankers, a crisis in capability. So not only does the U.S. Navy not have enough warships to do it, it doesn't have enough support ships to keep it sustained. These two stories should be sending up alarm bells through the U.S. Navy. And let's go into some detail and break this down a little bit. So this is a chart that came from the GAO study, and the GAO study really goes into some detail about this. Uh, I'll have in the show notes here the link to the GCAP story, but also a link over to USNI News and their story on this. So the GAO looked at the metrics for 10 ship classes from 2011 up until 2021, so a decade they're looking at. Persistent and worsening sustainment challenges. Uh, specifically, the number of maintenance uh, cannibalizations. Basically, you steal a piece off one ship and you put it on another ship. They then talked about category three and four uh, casualties. Uh, and these are the type of casualties that could take a ship offline. Cas uh, Cat four takes it right offline. Cat three is a significant degradation. And what you see is the number of those casualties are just going up. And then the days of maintenance delay are all going up. In other words, it is getting more difficult to sustain the U.S. Navy platforms. And these are the premier platforms for the U.S. Navy. Ticon Ticonderoga-class cruisers, Nimitz-class carriers, Arleigh Burke destroyers, LCSs, the American Wasp-class helicopter assault ships, the major amphibs, including the San Antonio-class. So th these are the ships that you expect to be on the front line for the U.S. Navy, and they are not performing. Go a little bit further here, and you look at some more of the detail here. Here is a change in cost and number of ships over time. Looking at things like total operating and support costs, it's up 17.3%. Maintenance costs up 24%, and the number of ships up 28% in those classes. So you're seeing escalating costs 
to maintain these vessels. And then when you look at the trend in cost per steaming hour, it is just going up. Again, when you look at things like the Nimitz class and even the Arleigh Burks, which is really surprising that Arleigh Burks are costing more than Nimitz class is you're at almost five mil, over $5 million in cost per steaming hour. And that is just absolutely unbelievable in my opinion. It really is. But then again, you got to think the first Arleigh Burke, uh, USS Arleigh Burke DDG 51 came into service in 1991. So we're talking about ships now that are over 30 years of age. Remember when you start talking about like World War II, the old battleships that were at Pearl Harbor, these are the old obsolete battleships. They were 20 years old. Here we have an Arleigh Burke destroyer over 30 years old and again we are building new early burks we're replacing them. the uh, the flight threes are in the flight two a's are building we're going back and retrofitting the old flight twos but again the flight ones the early versions over 30 years old and they need to start being phased out here soon and so you're seeing a lot of this and look at how much of that cost for an early burke destroyer isn't just maintenance costs but other operating and support costs this is a really expensive proposition and add to it, the U.S. Navy does not have enough support vessels to sustain them, uh, oilers, uh, commercial tankers to refuel the oilers. You have the reduction of the uh, uh, Red Hill facility, which we've talked about. And then another story I didn't even bring up is the fact that the Navy just recently closed four dry docks on the West Coast, three up at Puget Sound, uh, Puget Sound one at, at Bremerton. And they're saying it's because of seismic issues, but we're not exactly sure why. Those are four dry docks. Some of them can, o the only ones that can handle nuclear aircraft carriers on the West Coast, one of them is closed. This is a major issue. This is huge about the ability of the United States Navy to operate in the Pacific. Remember, we operate 11 aircraft carriers. One of those aircraft carriers is always out of service, undergoing nuclear refueling. That means you have five air aircraft carriers on the West Coast, five on the East Coast. You have at least one forward deployed at all time with one backup right there. So that means you have two in the Pacific, two in the Atlantic, ready to go. The other three are either coming off, coming on, or in the middle of a maintenance availability. And if you think about it, back in 1990, we fielded six aircraft carriers during Desert Storm, Desert Shield. During operations in Iraq in 2003, we fielded five aircraft carriers. We're down to four now. We're down to the ability to operate four. And if you're operating against China, two of your aircraft carriers are in the wrong ocean. They're going to have to come across, either through the Suez Canal or around the southern tip of South America or the southern tip of South Africa to get into the Pacific. Two places, by the way, in which the Chinese are operating today. Talks about operating a new Navy base in South America, and they're doing military operations right now, exercises with the South African Navy. This is a paramount issue. Go back to Bruce Jones's book, uh, To Rule the Waves, right there, there it is, right up there. One of the things he talks about is the fact that the U.S. Navy, along with its allies, provided freedom of the seas. We benefited greatly in terms of trade. What happens if we go back to regional powers, regional navies, and you have to worry about losing control of the sea? This is a big issue that's going to impact commercial shipping going forward. All right, let's go ahead to story number two. Story number two takes us over to Russia, Ukraine, and specifically oil, and particularly the transshipment of oil out of Russia. So. February 5th is looming on the horizon. We're getting ready to see a price cap go on to Russian diesel fuel. We're going to see Russian diesel being exempted or sanctioned out of the European Union. This is all going to once again see a change. Now, the crude oil has not been a major issue, largely because your crude oil is way below the price cap of $60 per barrel. However, diesel fuel is talking about being at $100 per barrel. That could be an issue. So a couple of stories here on G Captain I want to highlight for you, and of course they'll be in the show notes. Number one, price cap on Russian refined fuels set to disrupt trade, what we just talked about. We're about to see that on February 5th with this disruption. Keep going here on these stories. We see Western tankers ramp up Russian oil shipments under price cap. So not surprisingly, we see a lot of Western uh, tankers. And when they say Western tankers, they usually mean Greek. The Greeks are jumping in there. They're really moving up these uh, shipments before the price cap goes into effect. Russian crude exports flow to Asia. We knew this. We saw where Russian oil is going. It's trend instead of going to Europe, it's heading into the Middle East, it's heading to Africa, and it's heading to Asia in large numbers. India in particular is consuming a huge amount 
of oil and goods. One of the things we're not paying attention to is how much India is developing as a result of this crisis. Got to keep an eye on this in terms of cargo volume going in, in both oil and other commodities. Very important to start watching India more closely. And of course, heading over to China. And this is the one I highlighted the other day. I talked about this. I'll talk about it again. Bloomberg story, New York gasoline shortage brews amid fallout from EU's Russia ban. Because of the ban on Russian diesel fuel, Europe has got to pull diesel from other places, pulling it from the Mideast, pulling it from China, pulling it from refineries in Turkey, but they're also pulling it from New York, from the end of the pipeline, from the fuel reserves in the New York mid-Atlantic area, which means diesel is going to be flowing out of that region, heading over to Europe, which means you're going to see declining amounts in those regions, and that leads you to increase prices. And everyone will be screaming that this is the Jones Act and all this issue, but what we're watching right here is this is part of Russia-Ukraine's war. This is the sanctions against Russia and energy traders picking this diesel fuel up and exporting it across to Europe instead of maintaining a set amount in the United States. Remember, the reason they're pulling it from New York is it's cheaper to do that. It's cheaper to pull it from there and sail it across the Atlantic than to pull a load out of the Gulf of Mexico and sail it that additional miles to go do it. They'd much rather do this because they can see it at a much better price. And a lot of people are not dumping oil into the Colonial Pipeline because it takes you 17 to 19 days. Basically, oil moves at about five miles an hour. So a quick jog is how this oil moves. And they don't want to lose their product while it's stuck in that pipeline, especially if the markets start fluctuating. This means big movement in the oil market. Need to be watching this. Tankers are sailing longer distances to deliver this crude oil. Diesel is going to be start going longer distances, which means those next level of tankers below the uh, very large crude carriers, what we call the LR, MR tankers, the long range, medium range tankers, they're going to be even harder to find. It's If you've been watching the stock market, tanker prices are going up. We see that in all the stocks across the board. All right, let's go ahead and jump into story number three. Story number three is a story I don't do enough and I really need to get on it a little bit more. And this is offshore wind. This story really struck me because this is a problem across the board. I see a lot of comments about the lack of vessels for offshore winds in the United States. And of course, it's the old trope. It's the Jones Act. It's the problem with the Jones Act that you need to have a U.S. built, U.S. owned, U.S. flagged, U.S. operated ship. This story from Bloomberg makes it a worldwide problem. Offshore ship shortage. Why Asia's offshore wind plants are stuck at sea. And basically, it has to do with the fact that there are not enough ships. And the reason there's not enough ships is because these wind term, uh, these wind uh, farms are growing in size. Come down to this story, you can see how offshore wind installations globally are increasing. They're just jumping up here in terms of gigawatt hours. How many gigawatt hours of, of, of power we're talking about? Is it gigawatt or gigawatt? I got to look back at Back to the Future. I don't know. That's where I learned all my electrical studies from. But anyway, you see them increasing. You can see in Europe the huge amount there. Not so much in North America, although it's increasing, but the real place is Asia. We're seeing Asia grow in this. But the other stat they had in here, which was really interesting to me, is the size of the wind turbines. The size of the wind turbines are just massive. If you look at the size of these wind turbines, back in 1991, you're looking at wind turbines maybe about 30 meters. And then by 2003, they're at 100 meters. By 2023, we're over 200 meters. And by 2030, we're talking about wind wind uh, uh, turbines uh, over 250 meters. It's like, that's it's amazing in its size. You're talking about these massive wind farms out there in these blades, which obviously require much larger ships to be able to install them. And it's really trying to keep up with that ability to do this. That's the problem. Now, it's being done. We're seeing in the United States new ships being built. For example, right here, this story, uh, Mike Schuller over GCAP and Crowley and ESV AGT advanced plans to build Jones Act uh, SOVs. These are uh, uh, offshore vessels for U.S. wind market. So again, you're seeing that technology coming here. You're seeing it being built. There is a big issue at play here because there is legislation at work right now to mandate that these vessels be 
basically U.S. vessels. One of the things that they're doing to kind of get around this is bringing offshore vessels from, uh, I mean, vessels from, from outside the United States to work these wind farms. Uh, and the thing here that they're trying to do is within the EEZ, the Economic Exclusion Zone of the United States, this is that 200-mile area of the continental shelf of the United States, is mandate that the ship's crew either be from the country of registry, so if you're flying a Panama flag, your crew has to be either Panamanian or has to be American to give American mariners jobs to work. It's a very touchy subject. It gets a lot of uh, people spun up for good reasons, obviously. Uh, but again, the technology is advancing so fast in wind propulsion and wind turbine production that ships have to keep up with it. And as you increase the size of the turbines, you've got to increase the machinery on deck. And largely what you need to do at a certain point is get a larger ship. And while they were using offshore vessels that had been used in the oil market, some of those vessels are not big enough. They can't support the necessary cranes and can't hoist the large wind turbines needed. So you've got to get new vessels built. So a big evolving story right there. All right, let's go ahead and jump to story number four. The CEO of Hopalg Lloyd says, the party is over for container shipping. I, I, I'm trying to be strong here for Hopalg Lloyd and all the big container firms. They're coming off record profits. I mean, massive profits they're coming off of. And what we're seeing here is the party is over. Just to go down here a minute, because they're talking about this. The company on Tuesday reported preliminary earnings for 2022 with earnings before interest in taxes, EBIT, up by 86% year on year to 17.5 billion euros. That is $19 billion. Uh, we will not get the full report to March 2nd. However, according to Rolf Haben Jansen, CEO of Hapag Lloyd, the party is over. We are back to normal shipping operations. Now we have to fight for every box to get our ships full. This is not surprising. We saw, saw this happening on the horizon quite a bit. The last time we saw this was during the economic downturn of 2008, but the situation here is much, much different than it was back in 2008. Number one, you've had a clearing of the field. You've got 10 companies now controlling 85% of the capacity afloat. You have three alliances, but we'll talk about why those alliances may not be as important as we think in a minute. But more importantly at all is there's been this massive consolidation and the shipping companies have divested themselves into different areas. And we'll talk about that. So maybe the alliances aren't as strong as we think they are. That is the subject of, an, of a uh, uh, story here that we're going to talk about. This story from Lodestar, cross-alliance cooperation on the rise as market weaken weakens. Interesting story from Lodestar. But then you weigh it against this story from Greg Miller, just how big are the global, uh, global container shipping alliances? The top nine carriers control 83% of the capacity, but the three alliances only control 39%. And what Greg did is he broke down the three alliances in these graphs right here. And one of the things you see is that the true alliance, the sharing agreement, is only a portion of the overall container capacity of the fleet. So if you look at Maersk and MSC, which just announced they're going to split as of 2025, they're only sharing about 25% MSC of, of their fleet is in the alliance, and 39% of Maersk is in that agreement. Now, I will say that I, I agree with Greg, but the other pro issue here is because they're in these shared agreements, they can do dedicated service, but they don't really have to compete against each other because that's what the alliance is doing. So, the, it, yes, only 39% is in the alliance, but you're still getting a benefit from being in the alliance. While you may not have committed uh, ships entirely in it, you're seeing that. And he did this. He broke this up for the Ocean Alliance, the Alliance, and then this chart here really looked at it across the board here and, and sees where it goes. I, I think we're going to see a, a big movement in Ocean and Shipping Alliances here over the next two years. What happens with Maersk and, and, and MSC split? Do we see some of the shipping firms jump and go other places? Zim is already with Maersk. Uh, basically, on the Atlantic side, will they become more official? Will CMA, CGM dump out of their alliance with Costco and Evergreen, two Chinese companies? Uh, there is no telling where this is going to end up, but it's going to be fun to watch, and I am excited to watch where this goes. Going on here... Maersk announced the closing the door on Hamburg Sud and Sealand brands. So a lot of these shipping companies have sub 
brands that they've purchased and brought into the fold. For example, Maersk in 1999 bought Sealand. Sealand was one of the largest container liners in the world, a U.S. container liner. And Maersk consumed Sealand and brought it up. But you will still see Maersk Sealand out there. You'll see boxes marked that way. You'll even see some ships marked that way. But in truth, the Sealand brand has been pretty dead for a while. Hamburg Sud, which was a, a subsidiary too, operates largely from Europe to South America. It's an old uh, German line that operated. They're just going to basically get rid of them. They're, they're basically going to just get rid of these sublines and clean it up and change things, which is part of a good marketing strategy, I would say. It's confusing at times. It'll also make them look bigger if they do that. Finally, you see MSC continues to strengthen the fleet for life outside the 2M. MSC is continually buying ships. Uh, you see them buying the Maersk S-Class, for example. They already had some. They're buying more of them. Uh, these are ships over 20 years old, built in 1990s. Uh, but they are purchasing them to increase the size of their fleet. I think that's a substantial move by MSC. They're going to go, and I had a conversation, I posted it online the other day with myself and Greg Miller over in Freight Waves, and Greg made the excellent point that one of the advantages MSC has is by buying these ships is they can sell them later for scrap and get some money out of them, which is true. But there's also the issue of being stuck with the vessels and operating older vessels with the new fuel issues coming out with IMO 2023. Uh, last story, last element of this story is this. The Port of New York and New Jersey closes out record year, but falls short of busiest U.S. port title. Yes, New York, New Jersey came up just shy of beating out L.A. Here you see the kind of the final numbers. The TE volume, 9,493,664 to be exact, ranks as U.S. second busiest port behind the port of Los Angeles' 9.9 million TEUs, but ahead of the port of Long Beach's 9.13 million. I'm very upset because classmate of mine, Beth Ann Rooney, is the port director at the port of New York, New Jersey. I was hoping Beth Ann would take the laurels away from Gene Soroka and be able to hoist the huge container over her head of being the dominant port in the United States. There's not a big container. I, I, there should be. There should be some sort of award, but there's not. But instead, Port of LA still ranks as number one, which really is an important element there because while I talked about the escape from LA being important, LA is still dominant. But the question is, does LA maintain its dominance going forward? All right, that brings us to our last story of the day, and uh, it, it, it's a doozy. It's a good story. I'm not going to lie. I, I'm kind of excited about this story. Story number five, you may have heard of Cocaine Bear. Yes, the bear that found a package of cocaine, snorted it, and then went on a terror rampage, which is becoming a movie, coming online February 24th, has nothing against what we see happen on the high seas. We have had Cocaine Bear, but now we have Cocaine Cows. That's right, Cocaine Cows. Uh, the Spanish have seized $114 million worth of cocaine from a livestock ship. That's right. The Spanish off the Canary Islands have seized a ship loaded down with $114 million worth of cocaine. And the video says it all. This video from the Spanish National Police show them boarding the vessel off the Canary Islands, uh, climbing on board. We've been talking about pilots recently quite a bit here. You see the uh, uh, police having to board up a Jacob's Ladder. Uh, onto the vessel, uh, nice and choppy. This is not a vessel, it's not a pilot boat they're coming up. So a little little bit of a, a harrowing trip to, to get up the vessel here. I'm gonna fast forward it here a little bit for you and show you some of the images here. Uh, this is them coming on board. This is them actually on the vessel, moving through the vessel. Livestock ships are nasty vessels. There are very few of these left out there for good reason. Uh, it obviously smells like a barn on steroids, uh, but more importantly, it's really hard to keep the, the livestock alive in some cases, hydrated with enough water and food to get rid of the waste. Uh, you can see the openness of the, the vessel, which is really bad should the vessel get in rough water and take it. And, you know, these situations where they get into rough water and start taking seawater, all of it becomes just a disaster. They are not typically very seaworthy vessels. You can see how poorly this vessel is maintained. A lot of questions. But here you go. Here's your uh, cocaine. Here are the bundles of cocaine that they found that they uh, brought up. And you can see it here. I think it's 
dangerously close to the cows. I'm not exactly sure why they're putting it here by the cows, but they did. But this is them hoisting it off the vessel. We don't have an instance of a cow snorting cocaine. At least it's not reported that way, which goes nuts and starts to kill and attack people. But there's just uh, cocaine on the ship. Spanish police did a great job interdicting that vessel. It is very difficult to track down illegal shipments like this. Obviously, you need tips. You need a lot of intelligence to do it. And even if you know on a ship, there are thousands of places in which you can hide cargo like this on a ship and find. It was a great job by the Spanish National Police to get this amount of drugs off the streets and find it. And to keep it out of the hands of the cows. Because I got to say, a cocaine cow, that's... That'd be up there with a cocaine bear. It'd be very tough to see it. I hope you enjoyed today's video. How could you not? I mean, we went from the poor maintenance state of the U.S. Navy to cocaine cows. I, I mean, where else do you get quality news information like this? Right here. And that's why you should really subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Well, you can hit the super thanks button below and give directly to the page or head on over to Patreon. You can become a monthly or yearly patron of the page and support us as we try to bring you these hard-hitting news stories uh, across the board. I'm sorry, I just, I, every now and then I need a good story and that was a great story to end this week's What the Ship. Until next week, this is Al signing off.